I want to talk about that reading from uh, Mark's Gospel when um, Jesus uh, tried to escape and move, this is one of the few times that Jesus moved out of Israel into foreign territory and it's quite clear from what we see in the beginning of this reading that I think Jesus was tired I think um, he was overwhelmed by the press of people that pushed in around him um, it's probably about two years since he began performing miracles and began preaching and um, he had spent the last probably eight months, six months, eight months right up in the north of Israel around the Sea of Galilee and finally he decides to move even further. He walks probably for about three days with a group of his followers around him, maybe 10, 15, mainly men, but we know that there was a few women that followed him. And he moved into foreign territory and he went to the coast into a section of uh, Phoenicia. The Phoenicians were a very interesting people that were scattered around the Mediterranean. In fact, the great city of Carthage was established by Phoenicians. They were seafarers. And so they were on that northern section of uh, uh, where, where Lebanon, Syria, Israel have all got access to, to the sea. And that's where they live. And it said, uh, Jesus goes in there to hire a house and he doesn't want anyone to know he is there. And he wants to be anonymous. He wants to take a break. And, of course, within a very short period of time, people know, oh, that fellow that's been making a fuss over there in Galilee, he's there. And this woman hears it and she makes her way to the house. And we know from an incident not recorded by Mark, but which uh, Matthew talks about, because Matthew was there, Mark was not. It turns out that she was making a nuisance of herself, calling out, pressing her case. And she's calling out, help me. That's it, help me. My daughter is sick, my little daughter is sick. Now why is she doing this? This woman is not a Jew. She's not a believer in the Lord God of Israel. But she had seen something, perhaps, maybe she'd been part of groups of people who had gone over and, and, and walked the 70 miles or so um, to hear this a strange man that was healing people. Or maybe something stirred in herself Maybe she'd never seen him, never heard of him, but heard, oh, she'd heard of him, but she believed something to the point that she was prepared to go. And she persists and persists. And finally, the disciples go to Jesus and they say, look, there's this woman out there and she's calling out, she's asking, and they, they say to Jesus, it's interesting what they say, they say, do you want us to tell her to buzz off? Because she's making nuisance. Now this woman is pushing past a whole series of great difficulties. Maybe there's even a language difficulty. Um, who knows? I mean, Jesus, we know Jesus spoke at least three languages, maybe four, probably four. Hebrew, Latin, and uh, Aramaic, and Greek. Um, so this was mainly where he was moved into a time, was mainly a Latin and, and Greek and local language. So she's pressing past that, but we don't know the details of that. She's also pressing past the prejudice surrounding her in that she is a woman. Now, according to the 
the social necessities of that time. A woman was not allowed to address a, a leading male figure in public. Certainly not a rabbi. Good grief, a rabbi was not even allowed to be in a one-on-one -on -one contact with a woman. And Jesus flouted that. Women, on a number of occasions, just go straight up to him. And he turns and he addresses them. Which is quite remarkable. I mean, as a true orthodox rabbi of the time, he should turn away and say, he could do it politely, say, excuse me, madam, I cannot talk to you. I mean, it happens with Islamic friends of mine who have come to our house and I'll shake my hand, but they won't shake the hand of any woman in the house. And they try and do it very politely, say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I cannot do that. Um, so it's a shadow of the same sort of situation. So she's pressing past that. She's also pressing past the fact that she's a Gentile. She's cursed. She's unclean. And that's a very central issue in this story. There's an idea of being unclean because there's a reason, as far as I'm concerned, why Mark has put that story here. And I'll give you an idea of why. Because it's at the end of a chapter and the previous incidents before this, in this chapter, are all about impurity and holiness. One of the great sort of um, wisdoms of contemporary New Testament scholarship is that the real essence of Judaism at this time was about purity. A lot of religions are about purity. How, and, and, and there are people that have transformed Christianity like this. So the, the primary object of Jewish religion at that stage was to develop a set of behaviours, understandings, and uh, that would allow you to preserve yourself from the sinfulness of the world around you. It was a difficult thing to live without sin. And the Jewish religion at this, set, uh, at this day, as in many ways Islam is today, it, it, is, it, it was a series of perspectives as to how you could live in the world without sort of polluting yourself. So the Pharisees, for example, wouldn't eat with someone that wasn't pure. They would always wash themselves, wash themselves right down to the elbows and so forth symbolically to, to purify themselves. They wouldn't touch various sorts of food. They wouldn't eat, for example, they wouldn't eat oysters, scallops, prawns. They couldn't eat pigs, for example. If they were in Australia, you realise there were no kosher animals anywhere in Australia. To be kosher an animal, especially a large mammal, had to chew the coat, had to have a cloven foot, for example. Kangaroos don't. Wallabies don't. And so on. So, Jewish religion in this day surrounded you with a whole set of very complex ideas, perspectives, principles, and laws that told you how you could stand in the midst of this world and be able to say, I have kept myself clean. So this was the big issue. And as far as many of the orthodox theologians of Jesus' day were concerned, Jesus wasn't clean. Jesus was disrespectful of those sort of views about how religion operated. And you can hear it. Listen to this. So on, one, on another occasion, he called the people and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand this. That's a translation of verily, verily, I say to you. Listen to me carefully. And understand this. Nothing that goes into a person from outside can defile him. No, it is the things that come out of a person 
that the farm. Jesus has been very earthy here. He's saying, look, you can... Now, now he has made a very profound theological statement there. So they would have said, well, if I eat these oysters, uh, that's not kosher. There's pork there. If I eat this pork, the fact that this pork has gone into my mouth pollutes me. And Jesus said, no, nothing. Nothing that comes in, that's not going to pollute you. And when he had left the disciples had, uh, and, and, and went indoors, he's, he, they questioned him about what he just said. And he said to them, are you as dull as the rest? Do you not see that nothing that goes into a person from outside can defile them? Because it does not go into the heart, but into the stomach and so out into the toilet. So by saying this, he declared that all foods were clean. He went on, it is what comes out of a person that defiles him. From inside, from the human heart, that's where evil thoughts come from. Acts of fornication, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, fraud, indecency, envy, slander, arrogance. And if you uh, follow Australian politics, folly. <laughs> All these evil things come from within and they are what defiles a person. And then Mark says, and then they met this woman. Because as far as the Jews were concerned, this woman who's standing out there saying, help me, help me, she is unclean. Even to touch her means that you would, as a rabbi, he would probably have to go into isolation for a couple of days to purify himself. And certainly you'd have to wash yourself. You wouldn't allow her in your house. She would defile your house. You would have to go through certain cleaning exercises, you see. So this is now Jesus, when he deals with this woman, telling his disciples about the nature of purity itself. And he says it's not this physical preoccupation with particular types of activities. It is something deeper within the human heart. And so they bring this woman to him and uh, she says, help me, my daughter is sick. Which is an extraordinary thing for her to say. You know, she obviously, obviously has come to some view where, what tiny little speck of an understanding or truth sort of lit up in her heart and said, oh, I've got to get to that man. But that's what was going on. And she, he says to her something that is probably one of the most challenging things that Jesus has said. Let me put it as best I can in sort of contemporary languages. language. He insults her profoundly. He says... Why are you asking me to help you? You know I'm a Jew. You know I'm a rabbi. We don't give food to dogs. That's what he said to her. You're a dog. That's what we think. As Jews, you are a filthy dog. Because dogs are not kosher. Camels are not kosher. Certainly dogs are not kosher. And so she says, she's not rebuffed by this. She doesn't go crawling away with her head down. She says, well, if I'm a dog, let me, give me some scraps. And Jesus turns to her and says, you've got great faith. Your daughter's healed. And she goes back and sure enough, so what do you make of that? Why, why, why does Jesus say that appalling thing? I mean, he's calling her a bitch. He's calling her a dog. What, what is he doing? Now, there are two theories about this. And one, the one that I aspire, well, I think there's only one that can account for this. Um, I can't believe 
that Jesus would just simply be repeating prejudice like that, insulting prejudice. What is he doing? I think that in a way he is challenging her. He's doing something to her that he has done on other occasions to other people. You notice, especially if, if you look at some of the encounters in John's Gospel, when people approach Jesus and they say, Lord, and they ask him a question, he'll turn to them and suddenly confront them. They think they're going to have, oh, look, I'd like to know this and I'd like to know that. Look at the encounter with Nicodemus, the great theologian, great Jewish theologian who comes to Jesus and, and, and says I know that you have come from God I know you come from God because you are a great teacher and Jesus turns on him and says something to him that just knocks him back you know, unless you are born again you cannot see the kingdom of God fancy saying that to a you know like the Archbishop of Canterbury or or, you know, the, the, the dean of New Testament studies. That's what this man is like. And this country rabbi is telling him, you have no clue what you're talking about. So he does what Jesus does this quite a bit. And he does it in a way that is based on, as far as I can see, a profound understanding of them. He has looked into them. He suddenly recognised someone who has battled to get to him. And then he takes him that next step. He said, you, and I, what I hear him saying is this. He said, look, how come you've gone to all this trouble and you come here and I'm a Jew, you're a Gentile, you know what we think of you. You know what you're pushing past. Are you prepared still to stand there and ask me? We think of you as a dog. What are you going to do about that? Do you still want to talk to me? And she says, yes. And then his love pours out to her. So, this is a great story. Small story. It's, a, it's the story of the Sino-Phoenician woman. And... It is so interesting in the New Testament that often it is women who push in the hardest towards him. It is women who seem to act on some deep instinct that they see, they, they pick up something and that is enough, that sparks enough and off they go towards him. So surely there's a couple of lessons for us here. Um, the first one has to do with the theology of holiness and purity. Um, maybe we have prejudices about the sort of people that surround us in this world. We say, no, we can't talk to them. Oh, no, 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 I can't go near them. I can't do this. And we start to push away things and we say, no, no, this is not of God. I can't go into that place. I can't talk to these sort of people. They're unclean. There's something nasty, something unsavory and so on. That can sometimes surround Christianity. I, I was aware of that. But you didn't play cards, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. I mean, I wasn't even allowed to dance. I still can't dance. But it's a, a major issue in my family. I cannot. I don't know what it is, but I cannot dance. And it's become almost like a paranoia with me. I, and if I stand up, I just I don't see. I've told you something there, and you're going to make me do that in one. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I um, I got distracted. So that's the first question. The first lesson I learned from this story is to look into myself and see: Is there anything out there where I am beginning to cut myself off? from those people who are, they've probably seen something deeper than even I have seen. I, I'm not calling them Christians or anything, but they are coming towards Jesus. I want to know, I want to know. And somehow we turn away. The second lesson I learned from this is the, 
wonderful persistence of this woman. So, you know, there is something profoundly important about the way Jesus challenges her. I mean, I am often approached by people who ask me, tell me about what you believe. And I can sense that there's a sort of taunting, trivial aspect to that question. And I don't want to answer it. And quite often I don't. But uh, for us, I think this woman has got something, she has got something to teach us. I mean, the fact that she drives on, she will not stop. She has seen the thing that she wants to believe and she wants to know more about. And maybe that's the thing with us. Maybe if our faith becomes so, we become so, so used to it that the, the questions that we pose for ourselves are trivial questions. They're not important. They're not questions that talk about deep commitment. And if we approach Jesus and we hear something, oh, we just turn away. And we don't hear the challenge and we don't persist. We don't see the depth of what it is that is on offer to us. And so, so there it is, this little story. Just a few verses, but full of such great wisdom for us, I think. Amen.